Good evening, everyone. I'm super blessed and thankful, and it's, it's just a privilege to speak with you guys tonight. And let me just tell you how good the Lord is. Okay, so last week we had uh, Prophet Theo here, and I was like, man, he set me up good. And then this morning, Pastor LaShawn went off on the truth. Man, the truth will prevail. And I just thank the Lord because he just, he just set me up for it. So I'm going to deliver, all right? All right, so can, can I pray real quick? I know. Uh, Father, I just thank you for this opportunity, God, to speak to your people. God, I just ask that you have your way, God. Move me out of the way so that you can speak. God, I just I thank you for your, your children tonight. God, I just ask that you open their eyes and their ears and their hearts to hear your message and to take away whatever you would have for them to bring home with them tonight. God, I just thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So... Um, I've been super bothered, as a lot of other people have, with this season, right? And um, with with the the body of Christ at large in the world, and um, the way that the enemy has attacked us this season, and he's pushed people out of the church, and he's pushed church online, and um, people are really just disconnected. The body of Christ feels disconnected to me. I'm really thankful that Shiloh has never closed, that he put that on Bishop's heart to stay open, that we've been able to be here to praise the Lord every week. I'm so thankful for that. And I, I, I just pray for the, the rest of the body of Christ that doesn't have that. But um, another thing that I love about Shiloh is that we don't, uh, we do have two services on Sunday, but they're not like separated by um, generation or like a lot of people, they do, um, like different kinds of music in the morning or the, in the evening or whatever. And we are all together. We worship together and we fellowship together and we get in the word together and we praise together and we just have a good time in the Lord together. And I really, uh, I'm thankful for that. And I, I feel like you guys are my family. Yes. And um, I just want to talk about the generational thing for a few minutes. And, um, you know, there's a, not that there hasn't ever always been an attack on the church, but there's an attack on the church in this season, especially with young people. And I think um, the young Christians are kind of lost, honestly. Um, but I just want to talk about the world and Christianity in modern history. I'm not a history buff, so please forgive me, but I'm going to attempt for a minute. So um, technically the modern era started in the 1600s and it went up to the 1950s. Now that's 350 years. That's a lot of stuff that happened. Um, this, you know, America became a free country. Um, there was the Enlightenment period, the Industrial Revolution. But I want to go all the way up to basically the last 50 years, the um, 1900 to 1950. Now this this was when my grandparents and great grandparents were alive, or well, they're still, my grandparents are still alive, but when they were born. And if we go and look back at the world at that time, um, it was vastly different from what we see today, right? Um, so, you know, the world has always clashed with the church, but it seems like at that time there was a little more traditional values, um, more conservative. It seemed like the church had a little more um, uh, influence, I guess, on culture than it does today. Um, you know, like morals were a thing at <laughs> one time. Um, so um, the modern era, all of, you know, all these things came to be in the modern era, and it gave birth to cri critical theorists and, ras and rationalization. So the secular world started to really take over, and um, it really started with the notion that um, we're in this enlightenment period, and um, the biblical God, they say that the biblical God is just a relic of previous superstitious and unenlightened ages. Um, this really transformed the concept of truth. And um, like Pastor LaShawn was saying today, you know, we believe the truth of God. And that's where, at this time, they started to just drop that, basically. Um, so they just, um, truth, instead of coming from God or the church, it came from man's subjective judgment. Um, so in this period, the baby boomers were the last generation um, born in the modern era, and then um, came Generation X. So at that time, it was about 1965, and when this generation came to be, um, they seemed to rebel against everything that came before them. 
um, the focus, you know, they were post-war, it was in the 60s, and every, the focus was on peace and love and, you know, decrease of inhibitions and worldly wisdom and all these things that we learned in this, you know, all of these theorists started coming out. And it's like, we've learned all this stuff, so the things that we used to know just don't matter anymore. And, um, you know, the, the generation, to me, I wasn't there, but to me it seemed like they just felt so smothered by the strict parents or, you know, like they would say, like, your children are to be seen and not heard. You know, they didn't feel like they had a voice and they felt um, suppressed. And so they were kind of fighting back. And not that the rebel spirit hasn't always been there because you see it in the Bible all the way back from the, be from the beginning of time. There, there was a rebel spirit, but it seemed to just really take over and increase at this time. And um, this, this time period started the postmodern era. And the postmodern era is character, characterized by broad skepticism, subjectivism, relativism, and a general suspicion of reason. What a breeding ground for mess, right? Okay, so, like I said, started Generation X, okay? So they gave birth to Generation Y, or as we call them, millennials. Now, before you'll start throwing things at me, <laughs> I think the millennials get a bad rap. Um, um, you know, I think most of our generation is basically characterized as lazy or narcissistic, but I don't, I can't really agree with all that, but what I can agree with is that they're mostly lost. Um, my experience is that, you know, growing up in the 90s, my influence was in TV and pop culture and music and movies and all those things, and it didn't really matter if you had good parents because it was kind of whatever was cool kind of went. It was, you know, whatever culture was. And I think, you know, culture has a big influence on your life. Um, but, you know, not living or not growing up with godly influence in my life really left me morally bankrupt. And that's what I'm seeing in my generation around me. Um, I remember when I was in high school, I was in government class and it was the uh, year that Obama was first up for election. And so we were debating and we were going over different social issues and all these things. And I, I realized like I didn't really have a reason on like pro or con, like I had to pick a side to debate for the class, but like I just thought it was fun to debate. So I picked whatever people didn't like. <laughs> But I didn't really have a reason. Like, I was just like, hey, you don't like that? Let's do it. I just, you know, I was a teenager, okay? But um, that's when I realized, I mean, it probably took me a little bit longer to realize, but when I look back on that, I didn't have a worldview. Like, I didn't have something that, um, as long as it was in culture and it was popular, that was fine with me. I didn't feel like it was, you know, my purpose really to tell you know, people, why or why not for certain things. Um, but let me tell you now, your worldview matters. And every important decision that you're going to make in your life depends on your worldview. Okay. Uh, but back to my generation, um, it seems to be that my generation is focused on social justice. Um, not a bad thing. It's just something that they're social, um, are focused on, on um, saving the world. Um, we t typically align ourselves with all these causes and charities, and we're trying to um, solve these problems that we see in the world, going about them in a worldly way, okay? Um, so not that these are bad things, but they're going about it just, I think, in the wrong way. Um, and then for those who aren't, you know, in a cause, um, they, like people in my generation, throw themselves into the work. You know, it's, it's important to have a career, to be successful, to be, um, to, you know, chase after money or whatever. So that's like another group. And then for the people who kind of don't have anything, no cause, no success, they turn to things that numb the pain. And so, you know, drugs, alcohol, sex, whatever it happens to be for that person, they turn to that. But what I've noticed is that if you take away the ability to be successful, if you take away the ability to be part of something that's meaningful to you, if you take away the ability to, you know, numb the pain, is that we're left with one of the most depressed and anxious and hopeless generations in history. I believe that this is from the God-sized hole in the world today, in my generation in particular. And I've learned that it doesn't matter what you try to fill it with. If it's not Christ, it's not going to work. It's not, if only God can fill a God-sized hole. And so nothing in the secular world is going to do it for you. And I've learned that and I don't, <laughs> I mean, the secular world isn't helping anybody. They basically tell you that you have no intrinsic value. You have no purpose in your life and there's nothing to look forward to after death. So no wonder everyone's so hopeless, right? So 
we have the answer and we need to speak truth, right? And um, just let me take a step back for a second. Along with the lack of early exposure to God, I'll say, when I'm growing up, and um, the belief in the age of science and proof and intellect was born in the postmodern age, um, it's really tried to drown out the existence of God. You'll see, you know, there's no um, lack of people debating, atheists and theists, you know, debating even the... um, the reality of God these days. And the thing is, is that if you do look at science, which is a whole other sermon I could do, but if you look at the science, it really backs the creation story. Um, which you guys can look into that. But I was I was taught to believe when I was a kid that, you know, that everything, all of that stuff was a magical story land, okay? It didn't matter if it was werewolves and fairies or demons or witches. It was all in kind of the same boat. And it was make-believe. You saw it in the movies and things like that. But it wasn't something that was real to me. Um, And then the idea of faith was really just pushed to like an extracurricular interest that, you know, I saw, I knew of a few people that went to church, but I didn't know what that meant. Like it meant nothing to me. It was just like, they do that, but what does that mean? Um, And the, but the, the main thing is that the real world is considered intellectual reality and the, and faith is considered fanciful. Um, So between that concept and then the sonic boom of information that has happened in my lifetime, uh, we have an overabundance of conflicting information. And it doesn't have to be true to stand. If you stick something on the internet, apparently it's true. Uh, So I think we can agree it's a big mess, right? So um, basically the worldview of most people today is just a hodgepodge of ideologies. um, And it, it really... They, they really mostly conflict each other down to it, and um, they seem to change def- definitions based on who you ask, and it ends up leaving you with whatever you want it to look like. What's true for you can be do- true or different from what's true for me, and we're just sort of like in a mess, and that's not how God planned it to be. This is not how he designed it. Amen? All right, so I got a question for y'all. Anyone here into apologetics? Anybody? Does anyone know what apologetics is? All right, so um, let me tell you why every hand should have went up, okay? All righty, so in 1 Peter 3.15, it says, Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. So the Greek word that's used in that scripture for give a defense is apologia. And that is the scripture that is the birthplace of apologetics, okay? And now I'm not saying you have to be an expert. You need to know every single answer to the beginning of the universe and all these things. But according to 1 Peter 3.15, you at least have to be able to explain your beliefs, okay? So tonight I want to get you... A little bit of knowledge. I'm really going to teach on some ideologies and and some of the things that I want you guys to look out for. But before we get to that, I need to at least get everybody on the same page. Okay? So, um, I... As I was writing this, it ended up being seven. I I wasn't planning for a number, but God gave me seven core beliefs of Christianity for biblical, authentic Christianity that we all have to to, uh, agree on, basically. Okay? So for the note takers, if you want to take notes, go ahead. Okay, number one. There is one God expressed in three persons. Right? So you can see this all throughout the Bible, in creation story, in the baptism of Jesus. Um, the one I wrote down tonight is um, Matthew twenty-eight nineteen, which says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So number two, God is outside of time and space, and he created everything. Okay? So in John 1, 1 through 3, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. And if you want to hear about everything He created, you can go to Genesis 1, 1 and read until Genesis 2, 7. Okay? Number three is about the Bible. Okay? So, Scripture is God-given and true. So in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, it says all scripture is given by the inspiration of God. It is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction and righteousness, that the man of God be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. And just for clarification, by inspired, we mean God breathed, 
which means it came straight from him to man and written down to be passed on, okay? Concept four, or principle four, is that men are sinful, okay? We were not born innocent, all right? I know that a lot of people think that today, but according to Romans 5, 12, it says, Therefore, just as one man sin entered the world and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. In Romans 3.10, it says, There is none righteous, no, not one. And in 3.23, it says, For all have sinned and come. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All right? Number five is that sin separates us from God. Isaiah 59 and 2 says, Your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you. All right? Number six says um, that because, because God loves us, Jesus died for our sins. So this concept is called substitutionary atonement. If you hear that term, that's what it means. Um, so I like to, just like a simple way, I like to say it's an even trade and it's fully paid. <laughs> okay? <laughs> um, so, of course, John 3.16 says that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him will not perish. Oh, oh. Mm, excuse me. <laughs> but have everlasting life. And Galatians 1, 3, and 4, it says, Our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us. And then in 1 Timothy 1, 15, it says, Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. That's why he was here, okay? And number 7 is that Jesus resurrected and appeared. So in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 8, it says Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. And that he was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to this present. After that, he was seen by James and by all the apostles. Then, all, then was all he was seen by me, which is Paul who's speaking also as by one born out of due time. All right, so this is the gospel, okay? And if you don't believe this, then you don't believe at all. That's why I said we need to, I need to lay down this first, okay? And in 1 Timothy 4, 6, it says that if you instruct the brethren in these things, you will be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished in the words of faith and of good doctrine, which you have carefully followed, but reject profane and old wives' tables and exercise yourself towards godliness. Now, just before that... In 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 2, it says, Now the Spirit expressingly says that in the latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. The enemy has already lost, right? And he cannot hurt God, so he's coming after God's people, all right? He is, he's doing this to dismantle the church, which look what's happening, okay? But he wants to prevent Christians from growing in maturity where they can be effective in the kingdom of God, okay? So about a month ago, Bishop was speaking um, on distinguishing God's voice from other people, right? And he gave this verse, 1 uh, Corinthians 21, 22, that says, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake in the Lord's table and the table of demons. It's not surprising to hear this stuff in the world, right? We're used to it in the world, okay? But this stuff is creeping into our churches and, and Christians today are falling to the voice of scholars, to charismatic speakers, to scientists, and to celebrities, all right? Listen, you cannot listen to every YouTube preacher out there, okay? And if you're not rooted in a biblical church, you're not covered, all right? You have no accountability, and you're, and you're basically just leaving the door open left and right for the enemy to come in and smack you around, all right? And he will not, he will take that opportunity, all right? So, if, that's right. And in the word, it does say that those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God, all right? So, if you're not, get here, all right? So, let me go back to what I'm supposed to be talking about. So um, what are these what are these doctrines that we're seeing? Okay, so postmodernism again, um, it started due to skepticism. All right, and they basically rejected all the ideologies um, that were associated with the time of moderate modernism, which included biblical teaching. So there's no lack of isms out there in the world, all these ideologies, right, that they've been created because of this intellectual expansion, and, and, and knowledge is great, okay? I went to school for a very long time. But 
these things don't compare to the knowledge and the truth of God. Okay? So I'm going to, I have 12. I'm going to go through the eight, eight first ones quickly, just so that you can hear what they are and just know them when you hear them. All right, so atheism is the rejection of the belief in God, okay? Agnosticism is the view that the existence of God, the divine or the supernatural, is either unknown or unknowable, all right? Determinism is a non-theistic worldview, and it says that there's an accidental cause for the universe. Pluralism says that more than one religion is true, that, you know, multiple can be true at the same time. Uh, perennialism says that um, it's the idea that all religions, even though they might be a little bit different, when you boil it down, it comes to the same truth. And if you've ever looked at Christianity and Islam, you know they don't boil down to the same truth, right? Okay, so um, nihilism is that life is believed to be without objective meaning, purpose, or intrinsic value. There is um, nothing is right and wrong, and we don't even know if we actually exist. Pantheism says that everything is God, everything, the chair, the trees, the sun, the moon, me, you, everything. Um, and then panentheism says that everything is in God and God is in everything. So they, they draw no distinction, which means he can't be outside of them or created them. He would have had to be part of creation. Okay, so the reason why I just like ran through those, um, the first eight, is because those seven core beliefs that I gave you refute those eight right there. Okay, so according to the scripture I gave you for those, all of those are gone out the window, all right? So um, I just wanted to mention real quick that if you're struggling with any of those seven that I gave you, um, pray and seek and ask your leadership for help. Don't just leave, okay? All right, so the next four I'm going to spend a little bit more time on because these are the ones that, I mean, like the ones I just read to you, if you're like, duh, you know, but these ones are seeping in, okay? And I'll show you. So, um, you know, these ones are, they're clear. You can, work, you can work them out in the world. It's fine, whatever. But we have to deny them because of what the word says. All right. So um, in 2 Peter 2, 1, it says, But there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even deny the Lord who bought them, and bring on themselves swift destruction, and many will follow their destructive ways. Okay? So we're seeing this in the body at large. Not here at Charlotte Christian Center. <laughs> All right, so the first one is relativism. All right, I mentioned that before, but I'm going to let you know kind of more about it. So um, in relativism, it says that absolutes don't exist. Um, what is true for you is different from what's true for me. Um, this goes, this is morals, beliefs. I mean, literally anything. We can, we can debate like the color of the chair or any, I mean, anything is just relative to a person, basically. Um, and... Basically, just, I mean, saying that truth is relative is a, is, can, it, it takes care of that statement already, but that's more of a mind game. Um, but in, in John 17, Jesus was praying with his disciples, and he said, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth, right? So for Christians, what we see or hear should be compared to the word of God every time. That's it, right? Um, and also in John 14, he says that he is the truth. Okay, he's the way, the truth, and the life. And in John 8, 31, he says, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Okay? So I hear this all the time, like, Oh, I just don't feel like God would want us to say that or, or want us to exclude this or, you know, I just, it's 2020, right? It's legal now. It's accepted, you know, you know, or, you know, it's like Pastor LaShawn was talking about this morning, you know, when our emotions get involved with people that we love or with circumstances, you know, oh, they're going through this hard thing right now. So is this acceptable? Okay. But listen, if it doesn't line up with the word of God, it's wrong. Okay? And if you disagree with that, then you're wrong. And while I do agree that we are to share truth in love, and I don't mean to be harsh, but that's the, that's the facts, okay? And it's facts over feelings around here, all right? All right. Second one is humanism. Um, so humanism is really heavily based on relativism, and it basically views humans as the sole responsibility for the promotion and development of individuals, and it emphasizes a concern for humans in relation to the world. So humans are the measure of all things. And so my question to you is, 
which human? Which one? Am I the measure? Am I, you know, am I it? Is, is Bishop it? Is Hitler it? Is President Trump it? Like, which human would you like us to base all of our morals off of? Which one is, is the one, right? So clearly, you know, for us, Jesus is the one, right? God is the one. Okay? So this entire culture has fallen prey to a relativistic, relativistic way of deciding which morals apply to them and which don't. Jesus called for the changed heart for every sinner, every down, whatever, you know, the destitute, the, the scum of the earth, but also every rich person, every successful person, every per person in the temple, right? He called for a changed heart for all of them, okay? It wasn't just, well, these, this sect of people are good. Good. They're, they're good, better than these people, so they're all right, okay? So, you know, I bef before I became a Christian, I probably, I didn't really know the term of humanism, but I probably, um, that was kind of like the closest that I was, if, you, if I gave, gave myself a, a label. Um, you know, I thought, like, I was a good person, okay? I, I, in the medical field, I take care of people. I take care of my husband and my kids, and you know, I don't do drugs often, and <laughs> I don't, you know, like, you know, I, for the most part, like, I was doing okay. You know, I wasn't hurting anybody. I wasn't a murderer. You know, and um, the thing is, though, is that I'm not the standard, right? And that's something that I had to learn, and that's something that God had to really reveal to me is that it's not about being good enough, right? And I cannot let anyone under the sound of my voice tonight think that being good enough is going to get you to heaven with a holy God. In Romans 12, 12, it says, and do not be conformed to this world, but treat, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. In Colossians 3, 10, it says, put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. I had to be renewed in knowledge to, to match the one who created me, not the, what I thought, okay, yeah, I'm good enough. No, it wasn't about who in the world I thought was okay or what I wanted to amount to be. I had to match him, okay? And he is holy. The standard is holy. So none of your goodness is going to get you anywhere. All right. I got to move on. All right. So hedonism. All right. Hedonism basically says whatever makes you happy. Okay. So it's a school of thought that argues that seeking pleasure and avoiding suffering are the only components to well-being. It's your best life now, you know, whatever makes you feel good. If it, does, if it bothers you, then it's wrong. If, you, if it feels good, then it's right. That's the standard of right and wrong nowadays, right? So Jesus' life on earth was a powerful argument against hedonism, all right? So he chose to come here to earth, which we all see how it is, right? He chose to come here instead of have a life of uninterrupted pleasure in heaven, Okay, to he went, he came here to die for us, right? And he went to the people who were hurting. He went through storms. He never had a, he didn't know where he was going to lay his head, right? It's not this, la I'm going to come here and have this life of luxury. And like Jesus's life doesn't match up with the best life now. Teaching and preaching that we're hearing. Okay. So as Jesus died for us, he also calls us to die to ourselves, right? So in John 15, 12, 13, it says, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no, has no one than this, than to lay down one, one's life for his friends. And in John, 1 John 3, 16, it says, By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us. And we, all, we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? Come on, and in John 16, 33, it says, Jesus said, for in this unbelieving world, you will experience trouble and sorrows, but you must be courageous for I have conquered the world. Okay. He has promised us sorrows. Okay. He told us that the world is going to hate us for believing in him. So why on earth? 
earth would we be preaching that you're going to have this awesome, glorious life? And I'm not saying that the benefit package of Jesus doesn't include better life, because, but that's usually because you have a changed heart, because you're a new person, because you've left behind the drugs and alcohol, because you show up for work, you have integrity, you're taking care of your family, and good things come from that, right? But it's not just because you're saved that life is awesome, right? Right? So we have been called to a, a sacrificial love for one another, not a continuous pursuit of pleasure. We have our own interests, our pleasures, our treasures, the things that we care about in this world. But when you think about those things, like, do they last? Okay, we eventually we're going to lose the people we love, you know, toys and cars and and nice things, whatever that stuff. You can lose that at any time where it, it comes and goes. Right. And sometimes, I mean, things only pleasures only last minutes, days, months, maybe. Right. But then they're gone. Right. But Jesus is forever. Okay. And I'm telling you, filling that hole with anything but God, we've just been duped into thinking that it's that we can just stuff enough stuff in there, okay? But you're never going to have enough money. You're never going to have enough cars. You're never going to have an, everything that you ever want because it's always something else, okay? It's just not going to happen. So my call to you is that in a culture that says love yourself, look after yourself, and treat yourself, Jesus said deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. So the last one is Gnosticism, which um, I, I agree. I, I agree with this phrase, but they've really like taken it and ran, which is um, I'm spiritual, not religious. Okay. So these groups, they claim to have this spiritual knowledge, which is outside of the Bible and outside of the teachings of the church. Um, they, pre they present this distinction, this distinction between um, this like hidden God and then a lesser divinity that they usually, um, they say like the Yahweh of the Bible is the lesser divinity. He created the universe, but there's like this special uh, knowledge, I guess, um, above. And they consider their principal element of salvation is this direct knowledge, which they call enlightenment, okay? And it's it's the, the knowledge of the supreme divinity, which is known as either the force or the Christ, okay? And they also, according to them, Jesus and the Christ are separate, okay? So um, basically they say that to acquire this knowledge, you need to... Um, basically use meditation and they just bring in a lot of like eastern teachings and things like that okay which you, you may see in some like bigger churches nowadays you might see this spiritual um, calling for meditation and using rocks and all kinds of things these days um, but they state that basically you can acquire this knowledge and be a christ as well which clearly is false, right? But they're sneaking it in there and they're using the Bible and they're twisting it, okay? So this, and this teaching is contrary to scripture because in uh, Ephesians 1, Paul prayed that the God of our Lord, Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in, his, in the saints? So he's saying that it's him that is our salvation. It's the knowledge of him. It's not in us. Okay? So they're basically they're claiming that there's another way to get to God, which is through knowledge, not in through going through Jesus. Okay? So that's kind of what they're twisting. They take the scripture and then they're twisting it. Okay? So they deny the separation of God and man through sin. They basically don't teach sin at all. You won't hear about sin in their churches. Um, uh, they basically just say that there, if you believe in a separation, it's because you've been indoctrinated by a church. All right? And so so um, they, basically, they teach that one is able to get through this through Eastern mysticism. They say that Jesus opposed the scripture when it was punitive or exclusionary. Um, and they do not recognize sin, hell, repentance, holiness, righteousness, sanctification at all in their core beliefs. And I'll tell you why I know this because I did some research. So um, <laughs> you got to know your adversary, right? Okay. So I did some research. All right. So, 
um, what, what, I, what I've come to is that they call it a lot of things, all right? But the main thing is that the leaders of all of these churches or establishments, we could call them, that are teaching these things say that they are Christians, okay? They are professing Christians teaching the body of Christ, all right? And they use a bunch of different terms like progressive Christianity, like modern Christianity, like we're spiritual Christians. They use different terms, but basically if you look at all their beliefs, it's new age, okay? It's all new age. And I went to their website to, um, this is actually called progressivechristianity.org, and you can find their eight points. And I was, I didn't want to read them all, but I just don't want to be, you know, told that I'm mischaracterizing something. So I'm going to read them. Um, so bear with me for just a minute. But these are their eight points of their core beliefs. Okay, so you heard our core beliefs, those seven that I shared with you. All right, so number one, believe that following the path of the teacher Jesus can lead to healing and wholeness, a mystical connection to God, as well as an awareness and experience of not only the whole, not only the sacred, but the oneness and unity of all life. Two, affirm that the teaching of Jesus provide but one of many ways to experience God, uh, the oneness and unity of life, and that we can draw from a diverse source, from diverse sources of wisdom, in, including earth and our spiritual journey. Number three says, seek and create community that is inclusive of all people, including conventional Christians, questioning skeptics, believers, agnostics, all races, cultures, and nationalities, all sexual orientations and gender identities, all classes and abilities, all creatures and plant life. Number four says, know that the way we behave towards one another and earth is the fullness expression of what we believe. Therefore, we vow to walk as Jesus might have walked in this world. Number five um, says, find, find grace in the search for understanding and believe that there is more value in questioning than absolutes or dogma. Number six says, work towards peace and justice among all people and all life on earth. Number seven says, protect and restore the integrity of our earth and all creation. Number eight is, commit to a path of lifelong learning, compassion, and selfless love on this journey toward a personally authentic and meaningful faith. So, some of that sounds good, right? But it's not Christianity. That's what I'm saying, okay? So, you should have noticed in there some things, right? I heard pantheism, panentheism, I heard relativism, I heard Gnosticism, pluralism. And that's, that's the main thing, though, is that these are Christians, supposed Christians teaching the body of Christ. And I have a problem with that, okay? So, you know, they're acting as wolves in sheep clothing, and they're going in, and they're teaching the body of Christ all of these things, and these are big churches, big organizations. These are masses of sheep being led astray, okay? And, like, if you remember back at the beginning, I know it's been a minute, but I was talking about, like, the lost in my generation. Doesn't this sound great to them? Yes. Doesn't it? Yeah, they're saving the world. They want to do good things for people. That's all fine. All that stuff is great. But the fact that there's more than one way to God, the fact that um, Jesus might have walked on the earth. If you, if I read a little more on their website, and they, they don't believe that the Bible is literal. And the one, the one that got me here is it says, believe there is more value in questioning than absolutes or dogma. Right? And so... You know, this, this new Christianity matches the world, right? In uh, 1 John 2, 15 through 17, it says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, it is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. Amen. So this is why it's so important to know what you believe and to be able to just, you know, have your ears perked up to these things or to maybe friends or family members who are Christians that, you know, or if you're searching around on YouTube because your church is closed, you need to listen for these things. OK, and if you have doubts, like I said before, seek them out. Don't just run to these places because it sounds good. OK, so in um, and Paul said in Second Corinthians 11, three and four. I fear lest somehow, as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he who comes 
preaching another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, do not put up with it, basically, okay? We need to pray for them. We need to ask God to show them. I mean, we're seeing... Uh, there's been a bunch of uh, worship leaders or, or singers and Christian bands and stuff like that who have just fallen away from the church. Um, you've seen several big name pastors repent for preaching a wrong gospel lately. So it seems like they're either, you know, something's happening. Some, the Lord is moving, but they're either falling away or they're repenting, which, you know, is great. Um, in Galatians 1, he said, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another. But there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you, then what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, he says it again. If anyone preaches another gospel to you, then what you've received, let him be accursed. God. So those core beliefs of Christianity that I gave you guys. I believe that without a shadow of a doubt, okay? And I'm not like an easily persuaded person. Like I said, I I really, you know, was kind of in humanism. I didn't really see a need for God. I was like, I'm doing fine. You know, I, what, what's the need? Am I really that bad of a person? All those things. It, it wasn't just for someone to, to teach me or to tell me these things. And I'm like, okay, let's go with it. You know, I, it wasn't that easy for me. I had to do three years so far, it's not over, you know, of asking questions and, you know, reading and trying to figure out, but like God had to show me. I had to come to, like Pastor LaShawn said, I told her yesterday, I had to come to the end of myself. Like I was like, I'm the one working and I'm the one, you know, paying these bills and I'm taking care of everything. What's God doing for me? Like he had to be like, no, you wouldn't have that job if it wasn't for me. Okay. He was like, he had to tell me and it wasn't pretty. All right. It was hard. And going through this walk isn't easy. You got to count the cost but you got to look in the mirror and you got to face that and you got to figure out what you believe is truth okay and I'm just telling you that I wanted to know truth I didn't want to just walk around here just be like okay well if everyone says it's okay like I guess I'll go along with that like I didn't want to just be like willfully ignorant anymore okay so I um I I seek truth and I found answers okay and in Psalm 145 18 it says the Lord is near to all who call upon him to all who call upon him in truth and in Jeremiah 29 and 13 it says and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart when you aren't stable when you aren't like I know that I know that I know and this is truth and you're not going to move me and I'm going to be paying attention for these things is that what they, they teach deconstruction. And that's probably why we're say, seeing all these people falling away. These big leaders who get in with these big organizations and they're famous for their music and, and for their teaching and preaching. And then all of a sudden they're on the news saying, I'm no, I no longer believe that Christ raised from the dead or whatever it is. And I went on the same website, okay? This is what they say. Just deconstruction of the, pro, it is deconstruction of the program, dogma, and doctrine of the traditional church system. So I looked up, like, what would they teach, okay? And so this is basically what they attack. They say the Bible is questionable. Um, they don't believe in sin or hell. Um, there's no separation from God. You can become a God yourself if you use transcendence and meditation and whatever. They can't understand why they're suffering in the world, probably because they don't believe in sin or a fallen world, right? Um, they, they call it end times hype because for so many years we've been saying the world's going to end, the world's going to end, but it hasn't happened. Um, if anyone tells you they know, they're a liar, okay? The word says that no one knows. And um, lastly, they attack the church because of the division in the church. There's not, there's not unity. Um, and they also think that the church promotes blind faith. And I'm here to tell you right now, this church doesn't promote blind faith. We will seek and we will ask and we will knock for answers with you. If you don't understand, we will walk through it with you. We will pray for you. Anything that you need, we are here for you because we're not asking you to walk in blind faith. And I wouldn't want to be in covenant with someone who isn't sure. Right? Yes. So all I'm saying is don't be fooled. Have your eyes open. Have your ears open. Pray for these organizations. Pray for the body of Christ. And to those of you who are like, you know, I'm a mature, grounded Christian. Like this messaging for me, I'm good. Great. 
because I need your help, because we gotta, <laughs> we got to get out here and tell these people, okay? we got to warn them, right? All right, so I have one more scripture. and Well, I'm going to say chapter, because I'm going to read the whole thing. So just bear with me for a couple more minutes. 2 Peter 3, 3-18 says... Knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lust, saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willfully forget, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, by which the world that then existed perishing being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same world, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But, beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for the hastening of the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat? Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, look forward to these things. Be diligent to be found by him in peace, without spot and blameless. And consider that long-suffering of our Lord is salvation. As also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you. As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable twist to their own destruction, as they do also also the rest of the scriptures. You, therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, beware, lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked." But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The world is passing away. All of these ideologies, everything that I've talked about, and idols and everything that we have, you know, tried to fill our God's eyes hole with, will fall, okay? They're going to fall. Frank, Dr. Frank Turk said, it will be no use bowing when you don't have the choice to stand. So when it falls, where will you be? Will you even have the chance to call out to God one more time? Or will the choice you make today be your last opportunity? If you haven't chosen to put your trust in Jesus Christ for salvation, I'd like you to come forward. I'd like to pray with you. If anything in this message has convicted you, I'd like to pray for you to just come forward. Or if if anyone needs prayer at all, I'll be here at the altar. It's open. Thank you.